So the puzzle. So I had to read Cities of Urbanization from 1996 and Money, Time, Space in the City, which is from the 80s. Both of those essays, again, are really from kind of the period of the 1980s, um, industrial decline and urban restructuring in, um, in Europe and North America. Um, and that really, and, and sort of developing, you know, Thatcher, Reagan, kind of neoliberal market disciplinary approaches to dealing with economic crises, including urban crises. So that's kind of the moment when he's writing. He's definitely writing about that moment, but he's also trying to develop a more general framework. So he opens, I'm going to mainly focus, by the way, on cities or urbanization, but I will, at a couple points in the lecture, get into the money, time, space, in the city essay. I think both of them are really, um, they, they articulate pretty well. They make pretty much the same set of arguments in slightly different ways. So he opens, but let me just start with, with the cities or urbanization paper. He opens, in a, in a sense, not with a theoretical declaration, but with some reflections on the state of cities in the late 20th century. He talks about a number of different trends, the explosive growth of cities, the proliferation of cities. He gives a kind of pretty depressing catalog of urban crises related to, among other things, poverty, including racialized poverty, environmental dis destruction, and authoritarian um, repression. And he has a lot to say about urban form. He talks about the decay and abandonment of buildings, including housing, in inner city cores connected to industrial decline. And then he talks about the ways in which immiseration or poverty is concentrated within particular zones. We'll be talking about that, of course, later in the term. He also, I didn't put it in my slide, but he talks about waves of um, white out-migration or suburbanization, um, which is also another form of enclavization in the sense that a lot of um, demographic groups, at least in Euro-America, especially white populations or white identified populations, um, relocate from urban or city locations into um, so-called sub so suburban locations of various kind kinds. And what he does in that opening foray of the, of the article, as someone who really knows deeply the history of urbanization in the modern world, is he says, well, this seems completely unique, all of these dramatic transformations and crises. But if you actually roll back the clock 150 years and look at like urban restructuring and strategies of urban reform in the late 19th century, there are a lot of parallels. So it's a very important observation because we, we, we may wish to think that this moment is kind of unique to this moment and that the challenges have to be confronted anew or in particular terms um, that are you know, embedded within this moment. In some ways that might be true, but the point he's making is that they're, they're part of a broader system, the system of capitalism such that there are certain recurrent, they're not always the same, but they're patterned cycles of crisis and restructuring and response. And, and, and it's through that he thinks that, that we can actually better understand and influence the challenges of our time. In other words, if we understand the ways in which they're also rooted in longer term historical trends. So he talks a lot in both essays about the project of urban reform, progressive urban reform. So he talks about how in the 19th century, as in the present time, or what was then the present time of the 1990s, there are these progressive urban planning strategies related to housing, sanitation, and utilities, public space, which engender, which, uh, which unleash and kind of generate um, support for utopian visions of future cities. And these reforms, even if the actual utopian visions aren't realized, they, they make a big difference in reorganizing urban space. But they also, he argues, with regard to the, the 19th century and the present, they reinscribe forms of oppression, domination, and exclusion, even as the capitalist city keeps mutating. So this is very important, both substantively, in terms of what he's telling us about our urban world, but also methodologically. Contemporary strategies of urban reform have to be, as well as the utopian and dystopian imaginations we have of the city, they have to be embedded within a broader historical system. Again, the system of modern capitalism that we're better equipped to understand contemporary challenges if we understand their structural roots and we can better understand their structural roots by looking at earlier waves of reform and, and uh, restructuring. It's not to say that it's identical, of course it's not, but simply that there are patterns. And part of his turn to urban theory and to um, social theory more generally and spatial theory in the latter part of the essay is precisely an attempt to illuminate the underlying structures 
that according to David Harvey, generate those patterns of recurrent crisis, reform, and restructuring. Now, for anyone who's interested in these reform strategies, urban planning, urban regulation, I'll just put in a plug um, briefly. Next winter, I'll be teaching a course, Sociology of Urban Planning Under Capitalism, Cities, Territories, Ecologies. And exactly this puzzle of the recurrence of reform and the failure, the, the apparent failure of these reforms will be one of the central agendas of that class. We can certainly talk about it a bit today. It's not our central focus, but that's something that I have an entire you know, quarter long lecture class structured very similarly to this one, but focused on urban planning. So anybody who's not graduating and who's around next year, hopefully if you're interested, we'll see you in there. It'll be next winter, um, probably similar schedule as this one. So, the, so back to the 1990s when he's writing it, the failure of urban reform in the 1990s, he thinks is manifested in, and he uses the term, the proliferation of new forms of urban apartheid. So extreme, often racialized, and definitely also classed, uh, or separation and division of people by class and also by race and ethnicity. So there are wealthy elite enclaves of concentrated privilege in the same city and the same web of interconnection with zones of abandonment and systemic marginalization, all of which, both the, the enclavization of the elite and the wealthy and often the white, and the, um, the, the uh, enclavization of the poor who are often racialized people of color, um, all of this, according to Harvey, is enforced directly through state action. And he summarizes a very famous line from Friedrich Engels, which I'm going to quote Harvey in just a moment, quoting Engels, which is basically about exactly this puzzle that reform recurs, but it keeps failing. And we're going to read Engels in a couple of weeks and we'll come back to this, but it's, it's, good, it's a very important formulation from Engels and it's worth putting on the table now. And here's, again, this is Harvey quoting Engels from a famous book called The Housing Question. So this is Engels. He says, in reality, the bourgeoisie has only one method of solving the housing question after its fashion. That is to say, of solving it in such a way that the solution continually reproduces the question anew. The scandalous alleys disappear to the accompaniment of lavish self-praise from the bourgeoisie on account of this tremendous success, but they appear again immediately somewhere else and often in the immediate neighborhood. The breeding places of disease, the infamous holes and cellars in which the capitalist mode of production confines our workers night after night are not abolished. They are merely shifted elsewhere. So a lot to be said about this, but the point I wish to make now is simply that the, the failure of reform is manifested spatially. In other words, the problem, let's say, of poverty and marginalization and exclusion, it may be, quote unquote, solved in a particular neighborhood through let's say a new housing, um, an urban redevelopment project of some kind. But what Harvey via Engels is saying is that the problem is systematically rooted within this, the sort of social and property relations of capitalism. So in the city or in the territory, it's just simply moved around. So a classic example, and again, there are thousands of examples we could give, but like think of like so-called anti-homelessness campaigns in big US cities where homeless, the way that they solve the problem of homelessness, solve in quotation marks, is to basically brutally repress unhoused people and force them to leave certain spaces. And what do the homeless people do? In other words, it's not, a, it's not about providing them housing and addressing the other kinds of social issues that might, that might engender homelessness like unemployment or other kinds of public health um, issues and, uh, and the issue most fundamentally of poverty. Um, it's, but what happens is the, the, home, the people that are unhoused simply they, they have to find another place to be unhoused. So it effectively becomes a strategy of repression. And meanwhile, the bourgeoisie, according to Harvey, according to Engels, is celebrating its success with solving this, this problem. So this brings us to at least the way I would formulate the puzzle. So, all, so what I'm saying with this introductory, this kind of wind up is that when Harvey's talking about all this stuff, the contemporary urban crisis, the 19th century urban crisis, he, had, he hasn't even really begun the essay. He's literally just, it's like a long warm up to frame the problem. And the way, so in other words, we think that we have insight into all of these urban crises and possible urban solutions. And he's kind of saying, you know what? We, we need to actually go deeper to even understand what they are and where they come from. And that's what his project is basically in the, after the first third of the essay where he's gone through everything I just 
relatively briefly summarized. So the two questions around which both essays are framed after all the kind of warm up um, maneuvers, I would say are the following. Number one, how should we understand the specificity of the capitalist city? It's injustices and the processes that have produced it. So if you just take a step back for a moment, in contrast to Lewis Worth, who as a number of you wrote about in your RPs, doesn't want to equate urbanism or even the city with capitalism or industrialism. He's dealing with it. He's trying to develop a broader theory. Harvey is not. Harvey is actually saying in order to understand what's going on, we need to really focus on capitalism as an historically specific system that emerges in the modern world and that generates a particular form of urbanization. So this is crucial, everyone, and I'll, I'll unpack this as I get a little deeper into it. It's not a theory of urbanization. It's not a theory of the city. It's a theory of capitalist urbanization, and it's a theory of the capitalist city. So the claim, which again, we can debate about, and you can certainly disagree with it. It's not a truth. It's, it's a claim. It's an assertion, and he's got to prove that it's useful through developing an analysis that is plausible and helpful. The claim is that um, you need a, an understanding of, um, in order to understand the particular forms of urbanization and city building and unbuilding and rebuilding that exist in the modern world, we need to understand their capitalist character. That may not explain every aspect of modern cities or modern urbanization, but he thinks the underlying dynamics and contradictions and crises of contemporary urbanization are intrinsically linked to capitalism. Therefore, we need a theory of the capitalist city, the specificity of the capitalist city. Like what is going on related to capitalism that's engendering certain forms of spatial, uh, certain spatial arrangements and spatial transformations. So that's puzzle number one. And puzzle two, connected to it, uh, question two, the second part of the puzzle rather, is how to understand the recurrent cycles of dispossession, exploitation, but also reform, revolt, and crisis that animate and transform the capitalist city across time and space. So I'm going to develop this, both of these points at length, but under the second point, let me just say a sentence or two to make sure that you're clear about the implications of this, which again, I'm going to flesh out. The, the claim here is that it's not just kind of a linear process of urbanization. You build a capital city and it just kind of churns away like a machine. For David Harvey, the heart of the theory is that the, the formation of capitalist urbanization is dynamic and crisis riven. It's unstable. So it generates exclusion. It generates um, marginalization. It generates poverty. It generates reform and revolt responses to that situation. And therefore, the whole formation of urbanization is dynamic. In other words, it's constantly mutating. And we'll talk more about what that means in terms of the urban not as a thing, but as a process. So we're talking about urbanization here. And the thing to think about, at least with regard to David Harvey's theory, is not just like a linear growth of cities. It's a terrain of battle. It's a force field. It's a battlefield. It's a contested terrain. And it's also a terrain in which it's not just that people are rebelling against capitalism, but that capitalism itself, through its own internal dynamics, constantly generates crisis tendencies. So there are all kinds of accounts that he brings into this essay and elsewhere of overaccumulation, in which the pursuit of profit undermines the ability of anybody to make a profit because it's sort of systemically um, uncoordinated. So it's a high, it's not an equilibrium. Like anybody that's taking economics at this university or elsewhere, it's all about equilibrium. You presuppose equilibrium, supply and demand on the market balance one another out. This is disequilibrium. David Harvey totally rejects the notion that there ever could be an equilibrium under capitalism, whether through the market or anything else. The system, because of the endless drive to invest the surplus and pursuit of more surplus is constantly destabilizing itself. So the puzzles are, how can we understand those processes? The strategy of analysis, which I'm going to try to unpack in uh, you know, the next 30 minutes or so, is basically threefold. So after setting the problem up with reference to these reflections on the contemporary and the historical dimensions of urban restructuring, he moves into some pretty abstract methodological and conceptual considerations. How should we understand the capitalist city? 
Then on that basis, he returns to further reflections on urban reform and social struggles um, and different ways to understand the latter. And this is, is um, what Teddy alluded to with your reflections on the, his critique of the communitarian, what he calls the communitarian trap. So he's not just interested in communitarianism as a philosophical position, but he's interested in it insofar as it influences approaches to urban policy and urban reform. And then layer three, this is not sequential. All these layers are simultaneously woven into the essay. Another layer of the essay is to develop an alternative theorization. Okay. So the core of this, of this lecture, we're now basically hopefully well set up to kind of really dive a little more deeply into the theory. And because I want to leave time for discussion, I'm going to be pretty concise in my, pre I'm going to try anyway to be pretty concise in my presentation of the next three steps in the lecture, the dialectical method, the nature of the capitalist city, and creative destruction. So I'm just reminding you of where we are. That's the roadmap. And I'm going to try to cover that roadmap in the next um, 20 minutes, which would then leave us um, 20 minutes for discussion. Is everybody with me so far? Let me just pause because that's I've set it up basically, but now we're about to like, we're going, we're like, we're going in, we're going into like the, you know, the, the, the inner logic of this theory. Er, er, thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. People are smiling. So good. I'm going to keep going. So the dialectical method. So just fasten your seatbelt. Dialectical method, the capital city, and then um, creative destruction. It's not that earth shattering, but it's actually like th these are pretty key steps in the argument, which if you, if you get clear about these three steps, or at least if I can help you with my following remarks, get clear about them, and then you return to the essay, you're, you're going to be well oriented to understand what's going on, which again, this is one of my goals in the lecture. This is probably my primary goal is to help you access these readings even more deeply on a second round than you might have been able on the first round. Okay, so let's go. So dialectics. So he says on page 50, the stance I shall adopt in what follows is largely governed by a dialectical way of thinking in which, and these are key, these, this is key, this is like profound, processes are regarded as more fundamental than things. So processes, things, he's going with processes, <laughs> processes. And processes are always mediated through the things they produce, sustain, and dissolve. So just to be clear, like I'm going to unpack this, but he's not saying there are no things and it's all process. There are positions out there in contemporary urban theory and contemporary philosophy, which I won't go into, but which are just everything is only process. It's just process, process, flow, flow. That's not what he's saying. If that were the case, there would be no dialectic. The dialectic that we need to understand here, it's a process thing dialectic in which process is primary, but it doesn't mean there's no thing. So, that, so I'll put it in my own words and then I'll unpack it in some slides. There's a process which produces the palimpsest. I think Nate brought that up in your opening remarks. It produces a kind of spatial configuration that we call the city or the region or the territory. And then the process is constantly unsettled that spatial configuration, and that's the dialectic. But to understand the dialectic for David Harvey, instead of just fetishizing the material structures of the city as they appear around us and treating it as a thing that we can manipulate rationally, we need to start with the processes and see how they produce thing-like materializations of the built environment. But we always look to the process as a way to understand those temporarily stabilized material configurations. So again, we're in a different world here than Zimmel and Worth. We're not dealing immediately in this part of the theory with people's experiences, although they become relevant later. We're not dealing immediately with um, interactions between people. We're dealing with structural dynamics that produce the built environment and particular social relations that um, are embedded within the built environment. And, it, and this process thing dialectic is the method that Harvey uses. So it's a spatial dialectic. We can talk more about dialectics in general in terms of different philosophical traditions, going back to Hegel and Marx and many other 20th century philosophers of dialectics. It's a fascinating concept. It's a fascinating tradition of also social theory. But for the moment, what I want to put into relief, I've kind of already said it, but let me now crystallize it even further. It's a spatial dialectic 
So processes take primacy over things. Another way to put this terminology from another um, theorist named Bertel Ullman, don't have to worry about his work, but he calls it the philosophy of internal relations. So anytime you look at an entity in the world, we have to understand how it's connected in its very constitution or its very developmental path to other relationships. So it's processes, not things. It's not abandoning the idea that there are things, but we always embed things. It could be a person, it could be a building, it could be, it could be any entity in the world that we're trying to understand, like, I don't know, a state institution. Um, but we have to look at the processes that produced that thing, which even in our grammar, any noun, person, thing, building, city, region, it implies, this is a deep problem in language, the use of nouns in any language, language like person, building, uh, city, region, implies that it's a pre-given discrete entity. And part of what Harvey is doing with this dialectal method is saying, no, it's not just the person, or it's not just the city, or it's not just the, um, the building. It's the process of a person becoming a person and being transformed as a person, or a city becoming a city and being remade as a city, or the same thing for any other noun that you might use, including space itself. Space is not just a thing, it's a process of spatialization. So it's literally like one of these moments where we might normally walk around in the world with a lens on the world where, ah, I see the world as composed of things that are connected to one another through relations. And what Harvey is saying is, take that lens off and put another set of lenses on. And the, what you start with are the relations and the things, whether it's a city or a building or a person, are the product of those relations. The relations are primary, point one. Point two, going back to, I think, again, Nate, Nate's observation at the beginning, the, these processes produce layers and accretions of the past within the city. So it's not like earlier social um, relations just disappear. But the built environment of any city, Chicago is a great city to study that, but even you know, newer cities like you know, Shenzhen and China, other newer cities and other parts of Ch China that are, you know, have been constructed and massively grown in the last 20 years, even there, you can see layers from the earlier rounds of urbanization inscribed into the built environment. It could be buried underground. It could be a building that's been retrofitted. It could be the grid pattern of the roads. It could be lots of different um, aspects that are inscribed into the city and the social relations of the city. So he's insisting that we try to excavate the history of the city, even in the present moment, and look at how the historical pathway of the city's development influences the present. And then finally, again, returning to a point that I've made a couple times, but which is really central and therefore does need to be repeated, the processes in question are contradictory and crisis-riven. So it's not just a linear development, but a process that experiences um, disruptions, often disruptions that inflict great human suffering upon groups um, of the aspects of the population and that inflict a lot of harm on, um, yeah, on social existence and, and public health. So struggle, contradiction, crisis, and struggle are endemic to these processes. So here's how he summarizes it in philosophical terms. This is from page 51. And I'm just going to read this slowly because this is another sort of crisp distinction that he makes, which is really informative for understanding the issues that I've been trying to summarize. Harvey writes, if, for example, the absolute Newtonian Cartesian view that space is separable from time and that space is a passive container for social action holds, then the question of the urban can be quite reasonably construed as merely the incidental and the contingent geographic site of political, economic, environmental, and social processes unfolding in time. Let me just explain. So in other words, if you think of space just as a, um, a container. In other words, there's just like a box or a platform and all that really matters is time because the platform is fixed, it never changes and time just simply unfolds on that fixed and static platform or inside of that box. So you can think of the city as like a circle and there's all this stuff that goes on within the circle but you don't really care about the space because what really matters is the temporal change of the social relations inside of that circle. So you could diagram that very easily. So that's the, the, what he calls the Newtonian, Cartesian, 
It's also a, a, a Kantian view for anyone who's interested in those philosophical traditions. He's contrasting all of that to the dialectical view, and he quotes a bunch of different authors here, Lefebvre, Leibniz, Alfred North, North Whitehead. So he says as follows, the more we learn to think of what Henri Lefebvre calls the production of space as an active social process, the less convincing this Kantian, Cartesian, Newtonian formulation becomes. If we stretch as far as the views of Leibniz and, and Whitehead, that space and time are contingent upon process and relational attributes of the world, then the manner of production of spatiotemporality itself becomes a vital component of the social process. So the idea here is the spatiality itself is dynamic. Are you with me? So in other words, instead of having time on one axis, dynamic, and space on the other axis, fixed, He's saying, no, temporal processes are always spatially crystallized and materialized. And spatial configurations are always in motion through social relations. So it's spatialization processes rather than just space, time. And the spatialization processes of modern capitalism in their dynamism, in their contradiction, are precisely what David Harvey is trying to un understand in his theory of a capital city. So he then introduces urbanization. He says, urbanization, it's not just the urban, it's urbanization. And he says it must be understood not in terms of some socio-organizational entity called the city, uh, but as the production of specific and quite heterogeneous spatiotemporal forms embedded within different kinds of social action. Urbanization understood in this manner is necessarily constitutive of and constituted by social processes. It's not a passive thing. It loses its passive qualities. It becomes a dynamic moment in overall processes of social differentiation and social change. So this idea of diverse spatial temporal dynamics, I just want to go a little further. He says, so even though it's the capital city, and we'll unpack what that means presently, He's saying that it's not, there's a lot of spatiotemporal processes that crystallize within this, um, within this uh, palimpsest of the capitalist city. He says there are multiple social processes at work in cities, and each process defines its own particular spatiotemporality. So it's a multiplicity of space times, which again, Georg Zimmel would probably agree with that. You know, there's a lot of space times produced within the city. They vary from that of financial markets to those of immigrant populations whose lives internalize heterogeneous spatial temporalities, depending on how they orientate themselves between place of origin and place of settlement. So it's not just everyone's embedded within the city densely, but there are different spatial temporal horizons of people and institutions and organizations within the city according to what they're what they're trying to do. I mean, if you're um, yeah, just depending on all these kinds of details, he says, he proceeds, multiple constructions of spatiotemporality vary according to age, gender, class, ethnicity, spatial, sorry, sexual preference, consumer preferences, etc., can therefore be found in, you know, a variety of places. Okay, so much for method. Let me keep going. So the cat, so on this basis, it's on this basis, everyone, that he introduces his particular argument about the specificity of the capitalist city. So what I'm going to do, I'm just looking at my clock here. I'm going to say a little bit about that. And then I'm going to say a little bit more about creative destruction. I mean, they're both really important, but I want to make sure we have time for discussion. So on the capitalist city, he basically says there's two different dimensions to it. One aspect is that the city is that the city is an accumulation strategy. And then the other aspect, which I'm, I'm going to summarize both, is that the city and the urban are constantly appropriated from below for social reproduction and possibly under some condi conditions to produce completely other forms of urbanization that aren't simply based on capital accumulation and the pursuit of profit. So first, the city as an accumulation strategy. David Harvey writes, capital realizes its own agenda of accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake, against the background of technological possibilities it is itself created. Urbanization in the advanced countries has not in recent history been about sustaining bioregions 
ecological complexes, or anything other than sustaining the accumulation of capital. So the idea here is that capitalism constantly engenders new technological frameworks through which useful things for people can be produced, but above all, profitability can be sustained. The drive towards technological innovation is, um, is basically fueled by the need to maximize profits and to reinvest the profits in pursuit of more profits. The claim Harvey makes is that every wave of technological innovation materializes itself within particular forms of the city and the built environment. So that urbanization is directly shaped by the waves of technological innovation associated with modern capitalism. He says, this one is from the Money, Time, Space, and the City essay. He says, capitalism, these last 200 years, has produced through its dominant form of urbanization not only a second nature of built environments, even harder to transform than the virgin nature of frontier regions years ago. And by the way, in brackets, the notion of virgin, na virgin nature will critically interrogate on Thursday, actually. I don't know if that's a, a useful assumption, but that's the formulation David Harvey chooses. But he's saying that capitalism also produces not only the second nature of the built environment in the city, but also an urbanized human nature. In other words, we change, human beings change by virtue of being in the city. Again, a point that Georg Zimmel would heartily agree with, endowed with a very specific sense of time, space, and money as sources of social power. So on the one hand, on the other hand, he says that capitalist urbanization, even as it's fueled by the, the relentless, voracious search for profits, involves the social appropriation of the urban. He says the other perspective from which to view the recent history of urbanization is in terms of popular, if not populist, seizure of the possibilities that capitalist technologies have created. So the claim he's making is that Capitalism, despite all of the exclusion and oppression and destruction that, from his point of view, it engenders, it also opens up possibilities. The problem for David Harvey, or at least one of the problems, is that the possibilities for human well-being and human social and cultural experimentation that capitalism opens up are privately appropriated by the few. They're privately appropriated, even if they're socially generated through the work that everybody does. And Harvey's claim is that this alternative form of urbanization, it's not something just in the future. It's already with us. It's already embedded within capitalism, an alternative, which is the struggle to socially appropriate that which is socially produced instead of to privately appropriate that which is socially produced. I'm just going to repeat that because that's pretty fundamental. I'm just gonna repeat, I'm just gonna repeat it, okay? So he's saying that capitalism with all the technological innovation and capacity that it unleashes, it generates immense possibilities for social life and for human well-being. The problem, one problem, it's not the only one, but one problem with which Harvey is concerned is that those social possibilities are privately appropriated and effectively hoarded by the few, including the, the ability to control the investment process that reproduces all of our lives, that's controlled by private capital. But, but he's, what he's saying is that it's not just like, oh, there should be some future moment where people have more collective control or collective access to all these materials. He thinks that other form of urbanization is dialectically embedded within capitalism. It's not just like, oh, we're dreaming of communism. We might or might not be. He's saying there's already a socialization of production and of space because of the interdependencies between people within the modern division of labor that is engendered by capitalism. And this, the chapters, the passages on revulsion and revolt in the Money, Time, Space, and the City article and the chapters on reform in the Cities or Urbanization article are precisely reflections about the ways in which struggles emerge within capitalism from a whole range of political and cultural points of view to try to appropriate the surplus that's produced by capital socially rather than privately. It could, and socially could mean a lot of different things. It could mean it through, through the community, it could mean through the state, it could mean a lot of different things, and that's part of what he's writing about. But it's about the social appropriation of the surplus rather than the private appropriation of the surplus, and it's also about 
socially seizing the capacity to invest and produce new forms of urbanization rather than having all of that controlled mostly by the owners of the means of production. So it's already with us. That's the message. It's not just, oh, I'm dreaming of some utopia. Harvey's claim is that that's already the social character of capitalism already engenders the possibility of its alternative. And that struggle between the private appropriation of the surplus and private profit-driven capital accumulation and various interdependencies that genuinely create a social and ecological um, world that we all share, that is the core contradiction of modern capitalism. So there's a lot there, but let me keep going. <laughs> Um, I'm going to skip this, but just, you, you know, the, he's got a lot about revulsion and revolt and trying to analyze different struggles. He's very interested in the, urban, the politics of urbanization. Like, it's not just an abstract theoretical account. He's trying to relate it to various kinds of struggles to construct, as he says here, an alternative society subject to different rules outside of and beyond the rational discourse, the disciplines and constraints determined within the community of money. So this is just one way to diagram that contradiction. The domination of urban space by private capital and state strategies to enforce or extend private uses of space, so space as an exchange value, versus what I just said, the ongoing popular struggles to appropriate. So appropriation is a key word, Appropri appropriate space for social, collective, communal purposes, space as a use value. And again, in any city in the world, that struggle, like I don't care where, like that, some version of that struggle is going to play out. You know, no matter what the, um, the political uh, apparatus, no matter what the urban planning regime, like th that struggle can be managed in, in different ways, um, according to a lot of different factors related to the public realm and, you know, the, the kind of commitment of the state and society to publicly, to invest, to channel surpluses into public investments, whether it's public schools, public space, public transportation, public hospitals, public health care, all, all of which are obviously urgently important, or whether it's basically externalizing all of the, um, the consequences of modern capitalism onto individual households which, and, and individual people, which have, you know, often obviously class, but also racialized, gendered, sexualized in ways that basically reinforces and often exacerbates the underlying inequalities around which, upon which modern capitalism is based. So I'm going to skip all this stuff because I want to talk creative destruction, but basically he's going through money, space, and time as ne nexes of power, the triangle of concrete abstractions. Maybe we can go into that more later, but I'm just going to skip it. So the last step of my lecture, I hope, are y'all basically with me so far? Like what I just said was like pretty dense, pr pretty, like a lot of content in that, in that section, but people are nodding. So I want to keep going. I've gone over time already, but I, I need to tell a little bit about creative destruction and then I'm going to shut it down and we're not going to have 20 minutes for discussion, but hopefully we'll have a few. So the, the thing about creative, about, about the core, in some ways, the core of capitalist urbanization for David Harvey is the, the linchpin, I would argue, is the concept of creative destruction. It's, it's through this concept that he tries to gain some analytic care, clarity on, on what's going on. It's through this concept that he then approaches the, what I was earlier referring to as the dialectic between the process and the thing. And here's how I would summarize it. This is another one of those moments where it's like, take a deep breath because some dense formulations are coming your way, but I tried to crystallize this as concisely and, and clearly as I possibly could. So here, here it goes. The, the essence of the capitalist city is that it can never remain stable. By its very nature, the built environment is going to be transformed systematically and continuously through struggle and through crisis. So that's not so complicated. It just means the supposed thing, the city, it's, it's not a thing. It's not going to be stable. It's constantly mutating. Creative destruction, that concept is his way of understanding that mutation. So the concept, some of you may have encountered, I have a lot more to say about this, but I'm just going to skip a lot of the side comments I would actually have enjoyed making about Joseph Schumpeter, he's a very interesting Austrian economist who taught at Harvard for a while. He's one of the founders, not, not the only one, but he's famous for his idea of like business cycles, which is a pretty important concept in the modern world. There are Marxist versions of it. Um, anyway, Schumpeter found, came up with this concept of, in, he wrote, came up with it in German, Schöpferische Zerstörung, Creative Destruction, from his book, um, Capitalism, Nature, C Capitalism, Democracy, Capitalism, Socially Democracy. Capitalism, 
socialism, democracy. And here's the famous quote. He says, the fundamental impulse that sets and keeps the capitalist engine in motion comes from the new consumer's goods, the new methods of production or transportation, the new markets. This process incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, destroying the old one, creating a new one. This is creative destruction. This is the essential fact. So I'm just going to read the last phrase again, because this is, this is basically what David Harvey's building on. So that it, it revolutionizes the economic structure from within. It's very dialectical. Destroying the old one and building a new one. Now, for Schumpeter, this was a theory of technological change. So capitalists basically replace old technologies with new technologies. So if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're producing, let's say, shirts in the 19th century in a textile mill, and you're using a hand loom, and you're turning that thing with your hand or with your foot, and then somebody introduces coal, coal power, machine loom, Suddenly, the thing, everything's moving faster, and you've revolutionized the production of textiles. So that's a classic example, actually, from Chapter 1, Volume 1 of Capital, as many of you will know. But that's basically creative destruction. In other words, you're revolutionizing the, the structure of production. If, if, if you're a textile producer in Lancashire in the 19th century, and you're using a hand loom, and all your competitors start using coal power, and massively increasing the nature, the amount of, of output, you're going to you're going to go out of business. You're going to go out of business right away. So it's a it's a it's a sometimes violent, um, dramatic process. It's not just innovation and everything is better. It actually renders technology and infrastructure and labor obsolete. And that's what Schumpeter is talking about. So he wrote this book. I just wanted to share this. The book was actually called Capitalism, Nature, and Democracy. I noticed when I was preparing the lecture that it was recently re-released with a much more jazzy title, Can Capitalism Survive Creative Destruction and the Future of the Global Economy? That was not Schumpeter's title. I thought it was kind of hilarious. Whoever the publisher was just said, hey, let's, let's come up with a title that might sell more books. You can put this, you can sell it in the airports, you know, and people will buy it. And, you know, if I saw that book and I didn't know, you know, that it was actually Schumpeter, I'd be like, oh my God, I've got to read that book. Like, this is a pretty urgent topic. But if it were called Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, it might be like, oh, I'm going to yawn. Like, what a boring title. So anyway, beware. It might actually be called. It might actually be the other book. But the notion of creative destruction, it's all over the business school press. You know, it's a pretty important term in, in economics. These are just business school writings. But um, And in economics, in different traditions of economics, there's some pretty interesting debates about creative destruction of technology. Does it does, does, it, does technological change really drive productivity growth? Is it beneficial or destructive? And above all, for people in development economics is the question of whether through um, technological innovation, whether the state can actually facilitate that. Like should the state subsidize electric cars or should the state subsidize certain kinds of industries in order to promote creative destruction or should it just be entirely driven by corporations? I mean, this, this debate is playing out right now, obviously, all over the world with regard to the pharmaceuticals companies that produced and are now trying to distribute the vaccine. Um, that's an example of, of creative destruction in the realm of pharmaceuticals. And obviously, I think as everyone knows, a lot of it was very substantially, not all, but a lot of it was substantially supported by the state. So there are lots of debates on that. What we're interested in is the spatial, spatialization of creative destruction. There are a number of books on New York City that look at the evolution of the built environment and the sort of architectural fabric of the city. This wonderful book by Max Page, The Creative Destruction of Manhattan, and another recent book by Alessandro Busa, who I actually know from back in the day in New York City, The Creative Destruction of New York City, all about layers of kind of engineering and infrastructural and architectural change. What's important for us is how David Harvey uses the term, and that's, I just want to cover that. So he says, cities are continually, this is, by the way, from the money, time, space, in the city essay. He says, cities are continually transformed or creatively destroyed as capital seeks new ways of using urban space to enhance profits and expand its geographical scope. Machinery buildings and even whole urban infrastructures and lifestyles are made prematurely obsolescent. Creative destruction becomes necessary to the survival of the system. He says, space can only be overcome 
to the production of a fixed space and turnover time, the rate of capital uh, turnover can be accelerated only by fixing a portion of the total capital in time. The fixed spaces and times of an urban landscape can only be overcome through creative self-destruction. And this formulation, I think, really brings it home more concretely. He says, we look at the material solidity of a building, a canal, a highway, and behind it, we always see the insecurity that lurks behind, lurks within a circulation process of capital, which always asks, how much more time in this relative space? The rush of human beings across space is now matched by an accelerating rush in the produced landscapes across which they rush. He continues, processes as diverse as suburbanization, deindustrialization, and restructuring, gentrification and renewal, all of which, by the way, we will talk about in future weeks, are part and parcel of a continuous reshaping of geographical landscapes to match the quest to accelerate turnover times. So um, I'm gonna have to skip this just to, um, yeah, I'm just gonna, let me just basically summarize what I just said and I'm gonna open it up. I, summarizing those last two slides would take another 10 minutes and then we're not gonna have time for discussion. So let me just summarize it in my own words and, and then let's open it up. Well, in a certain way, like he's basically, like I just summarized something I've been saying the, the whole lecture, but giving it a, a term, a, a kind of conceptual specificity, creative destruction. Let me just concretize it with reference to an example. So please everyone imagine Detroit in the 1960s. It's a city, like even if you don't know that much about Detroit, I'm gonna just give you like a very generic characterization of it. It's a city that's filled, that's dominated by the car industry. There's lots of infrastructure, big automobile plants, lots of other plants supplying the automobile plants with different materials, different kinds of inputs. So there's a huge industrial agglomeration, huge infrastructure related to the car industry. There's also massive working class neighborhoods, segregated racially, but nonetheless, there's a large black working class, there's a large white working class, and kind of suburban rims around it in which a lot of people employed in different managerial capacities uh, for the car industry are living. Fast forward 15 or 20 years to the 1970s. The global car industry has gone into crisis. There is massive competition uh, to the US car industry from Japanese, um, Korean, and other car industries which are increasingly changing their technologies, producing new kinds of cars, um, and just it's becoming a more competitive market. There's a massive shrinkage and crisis of the US car industry. Massive unemployment, massive restructuring of the built environment. So a lot can be said about this, and we'll read more about Detroit, I think, in, in later in the term, but the, the, like it's a good, simple illustration of creative destruction as follows. The factories themselves at that moment in Detroit, they were perfectly functional. It wasn't as if they had amortized, like, oh, the, you know, the, the infrastructure was rusted or broken. It was still totally functional. But it had to be creative destroyed, had to, because it was no longer profitable to produce using those technologies, those infrastructures, that particular configuration of unionized labor in relation to the imperatives of profitability in the world market in that particular moment. So creative destruction ensues. This is the point I wish to make from this. For David Harvey, not simply because infrastructure is used up and you have to kind of build something new, like a house wears out, and it's like, okay, we've got to build a new roof or something like that. The temporality of it is calibrated with the crisis tendencies and uneven development in the world economy of capital. It's calibrated with the profitability of capital, even though people's livelihoods, their homes, their communities, their societies are embedded within that particular fabric of production and reproduction, it's destabilized, it's ruptured, and there's a new round of investment and reinvestment. In Detroit, it's been mainly disinvestment. I mean, they've been trying to reinvest and reboot the urban economy for a while. But think of this as a metaphor. I mean, of course, it plays out in lots of different ways around the world. But every time there's a major economic crisis, whether systemically or in a particular sector, it ricochets 
across the cities, regions, and territories where those sectors are, are clustered. And that's a creative destruction. It triggers disinvestment, or what David Harvey calls devalorization, um, and massive social suffering, and then a process of reconstitution and eventual reinvestment. It's unevenly developed because sometimes the crisis and decline in one place is accompanied by growth and dynamism elsewhere. So the crisis of Detroit in the 1960s, if you were looking at the same re reworking of the global car industry from the point of view of, let's say, Sao Paulo, or Brazil, it would actually look like a moment of dramatic industrial growth in a previously relatively unindustrialized part of the world. So it's unevenly developed in space, and that's, that's cr crucial for David Harvey to the geography of capitalism. And let, I'll make this my concluding remark on this for now. So it's not just that a single location or region undergoes this creative destruction, but that the creative destruction processes, it's like, think of like a checkerboard of locations and territories in the world and they're all interconnected with one another in the world economy, and they're constantly being reshaped and rewoven and rearticulated in relationship to the broader dynamics of modern capitalism. Sometimes there are large scale crises like the COVID crisis is obviously affecting every part of the world. The, the last global financial crisis, 2007 to 2009, it affected like no, no place in the world was insulated from that, although some places were harder hit than others, but there's always for David Harvey that uneven, uneven development. So the dynamics of creative destruction imply that like any spatial arrangement of the city, whether it's where we live, where we work, how we get around the city, how we come together in public space, it's constantly subject to potential destabilization in the context of these broader crisis tendencies of capitalism. So, okay, that was, um, that was a desperate attempt to summarize this argument in, um, in a single lecture.